This is chapter four of atoms and elements, and section two is all about the periodic table. The periodic table organizes all 118 known elements into groups with similar properties, and it also places them in order of increasing atomic mass or atomic number. The periodic table can be used to identify an element as a metal, a non-metal, or a metalloid. We're going to learn about that right now, uh, as well as how to identify the group and period of an element. So in the periodic table, elements are arranged according to properties. The chemist who first devised the periodic table had no understanding of the underlying atomic structure of the elements, but he was able to see that they fell into different types, different groups, where groups had similar chemical properties. So for example, all of the elements that were very reactive with water were placed into one group. All of the elements that had formed colorful gases were placed into another group. Okay? These groups, which contain elements with similar properties, evolved into the columns that we know today in the periodic table. So when we talk about the group in a periodic table, we're referring to a vertical column. When we talk about the periods of the periodic table, we're talking about a horizontal row. The group numbers are written at the top of each vertical column, and they use the letter A for the representative elements, and we'll see what that means in a moment, and the letter B for the transition elements. There is a newer system that does away with the A and the B designations and just numbers the columns from left to right, 1 through 18. So there's 18 columns in the periodic table, so it just numbers the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up through 18. Both systems are currently in use, so the 1 through 18 numbering is the more modern one, uh, but both of them are still used, both of them have some advantages, and so most periodic tables that you find will include both group numbers. So it's important to be able to work with both. Here we see what we're talking about as far as the group numbers. So this is a blank periodic table. Um, it doesn't have the elements in it, but it does have the names of some of the different groups, right? So for example, this first group over here is the alkali metals, right? And this is group one in the new system or in the old system, it was 1A. Right next to it, you have group 2A in the old system or two in the new system. In the old system, where you just counted for the representative elements in this in A, right? So you went from 1A to 2A, and then you skipped all the way over here to 3A, right? And these are the other groups of representative elements. So 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A, 8A. In the newer numbering system, you don't skip the transition metals when you're numbering. So you have the first column is one, second column is two, and then the transition metals continue with three, four, five, six, seven, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and then you get to 13 here, and then it continues 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. So the groups are columns and they have similar properties and so they're also given names, right? You have the alkali metals, the alkaline earth metals, these middle uh, metals are called the transition metals, etc. The alkali metals are lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, and cesium, okay? These are the group one metals. They're all highly reactive with water. You might have noticed that hydrogen is actually above lithium in the periodic table, but for obvious reasons, hydrogen is not considered a metal. Its properties are very different from the others. Um, it is placed there because of our modern understanding of the structure of atoms, but hydrogen is not exactly a metal, so it's not usually included, well, it's not included with the alkali metals. The second group, group 2A or 2 in the new system, are the alkaline earth metals, okay? similar to the alkali metals, but alkaline earth metals. These are shiny um, and metallic as their metals, but they're not as reactive as the group 1A metals. And these are beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, and radium. Skipping to the other side of the periodic table, we have a group known as the halogens. So this is group 7A or 17. It's right before the last column. The last column or group is group 18. Those are the noble gases. These are the halogens right before that. And these are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and acetine. And you can see that they are pretty much all colorful gases, right? Iodine forms this purple gas. Bromine 
is usually a liquid, but it can form this red gas. Chlorine forms a green gas. So they were grouped together for that reason. And later on, it was realized that they also have similar chemical structures. So if we are given the period and group for an element, we should be able to determine what element it is we're talking about. So in order to do that, we'll need to use the periodic table. So before we can answer any of these questions, we're going to want to bring up a periodic table. Okay. So we can, if we're at home, we can just go to Google and type in periodic <laughs> table. And we have the Wikipedia comes up first, but this is one I like to use. It's actually just ptable.com. It's the dynamic periodic table. And it's pretty useful uh, for when you're working at home. You can hover the mouse over the column numbers, the group numbers. You can see it uses the modern system, 1 through 18. And if you hover the mouse over that, it just highlights that group. If you hover the mouse over a period, it highlights that row or period. Right? If you highlight it over a particular element, then that element becomes highlighted here, right? And it also is color coded according to the different types. So the alkali metals are these orange colors. If you hover over where it says alkali metals here, it'll highlight those. Alkaline earth metals here in yellow. Uh, the lanthanoids and actinoids, which we're not gonna really deal with too much in this course, but those are the ones down below. You can see they're sort of separate from the rest of the table. The transition metals here. Uh, the metals that come after the transition metals, which are the post-transition metals, the metalloids, which we'll learn about in a moment, and then the non-metals, and finally the noble gases. So these are all different types of elements, and you can just single them out by hovering over this section of the periodic table here. So going back to our slides, we were looking at group 7A, period 4. So group 7A, period 4, well, group 7A is this. In the new system, that's 17, right? Remember, 7A, the A refers to the representative elements. So we're not talking about this group 7. This is the part of the transition elements. We're talking about group 17, really. And then it said period 4, right? So period 4 means you would count down four rows. But be careful, because even though group 17 begins with fluorine, Fluorine is in the second period here. So you always count from the first period, even if there are no first period elements in the group. So this would be one, this would be period two, this would be period three, and this would be period four. So if you look at the element that's in group 17 of period four, it's bromine here. So the answer to that question is bromine. Group seven, period four, bromine. Group 2A, period three, let's look, group 2A. Group 2A, again, is the representative elements. Period three is this period. And so we're looking at magnesium. That would be here. And then last but not least, 5A, group 5A, or in the new system, 15, right? These questions actually give you the new group number as well, and you're usually given that as well, so just be careful about that. Uh, so group 15, period 2, is going to be, let's see, group 15 is here, period 2 is here. Remember, even though it's the first one in that column, it's in technically in period 2. So group 15, period 2, is going to be nitrogen. So as we saw in that periodic table demonstration, there, the periodic table is divided into metals and non-metals, and between the metals and non-metals, we have the metalloids. So the metals are all located on the left, the lower left of the periodic table, and the non-metals are on the upper right of the periodic table. And the dividing line is where the metalloids occur. So the dividing line is in the representative elements on the right-hand side, starting with boron, and going through silicon, germanium, arsenic, tin, tellurium, polonium, acetine, and tennessine. So these are metalloids. Anything further to the right and above these is a non-metal. Anything further down and to the left is a metal. 
metals, non-metals, and metalloids all have different uh, typical characteristics. So the metals, uh, except for hydrogen, so again, hydrogen is on the left-hand side, but it's way up at the top and its properties are not typical properties of a metal. So we don't really consider it a metal, even though it's on the left-hand side. But for the other metals, uh, any metal located on the left-hand side of the periodic table is gonna be shiny and ductile, meaning it can be sort of hammered out or extruded into wires or hammered into leaf. Um, and metals also tend to conduct heat and electricity. They're also virtually all solids at room temperature. The only exception to that is mercury, which for peculiar reasons is a liquid at room temperature. Nonmetals located on the right side of the periodic table uh, tend to be dull and brittle, so you can't hammer them out into foil or, or wire or extrude them into wire because they're brittle. They'll just crumble into powder. Um, and they're not shiny, they don't reflect light the same way, so they're dull. And for similar reasons, they don't conduct electricity well and they don't conduct heat well, so they're also insulators as opposed to conductors. Nonmetals also tend to have lower densities and melting points than metals. Some nonmetals, in fact, are not even solid at room temperature. A lot of nonmetals are gases like oxygen and nitrogen. These are nonmetals that are gases in their natural state. And of course, between them, we have the metalloids. And as you might expect, the properties of the metalloids are sort of intermediate between the properties of the metals and the nonmetals. So they are slightly better conductors than nonmetals, but not quite as good as metals. And that is one of the most important properties of them because one of the most important metalloids known is silicon. Silicon is the basis for all digital technology that we use. And the reason for that is that because silicon has sort of an intermediate conductivity, we can mix different atoms into the silicon to sort of control its conductivity. And that having that control over the conductivity and how it transfers electrons allows us control over the information that's represented by those electrons. And so that's why silicon is used as the basis for digital technology. Here we have a chart that just summarizes uh, some of these properties with representative examples of the elements, right? So silver is a good representation of a metal, antimony is a good representation of a metalloid, and sulfur is a good representation of a non-metal. So you can review their uh, typical properties here. So just based on the position on the periodic table, uh, we should be able to classify elements as metal, non-metal, or metalloid. Okay, sodium. So most people think of sodium in their diet, and so they might not be inclined to think of sodium as a metal, but if you look at the periodic table, sodium is all the way over here on the left side, right? It's in the first group. Sodium is indeed a metal. Chlorine is all the way on the right side of the periodic table. In its natural elemental state, chlorine forms a gas, and so chlorine is a non-metal. Silicon, as I just mentioned, is one of those metalloids that's right at the boundary between the metals and the non-metals. Okay, so silicon is a metalloid. Iron, you probably don't need to look at a periodic table to know that iron is a metal. It's one of the most common metals that we know of, known since antiquity. And the last one is carbon. Carbon is a non-metal, right? You are carbon-based life form. So you're not made out of metal, although you do have some metal in you, but you are mostly carbon. Carbon is a non-metal. Okay, so we have chlorine here, uh, carbon here, iron here, silicon here, sodium here. Okay, so just based on their positions, you should be able to tell whether they're metals or non-metals, even if you don't have quite as fancy a periodic table as this. So now we're looking at the descriptions in terms of the groups or the uh, metallicness of the elements, let's say. So if we're looking at group four, for instance, the metals in group four, which are the metals in group four? Well, let's go to our periodic table and we'll look at group four, really 14 or 4A. And what are the metals in this group? So remember, metals are on the left and the bottom of the periodic table. So if you start at the top of the group, typically the, the higher ones, the ones further up in the group, are gonna be nonmetals. So in this case, for group four, carbon is a nonmetal. And then we have the metalloids, silicon and germanium, 
And so the metals in group four are really just SN and PB. You probably don't know those chemical symbols yet, but SN you can see here is tin and PB is lead. So tin and lead are the metals in group four. The nonmetals in group five is the next question. The nonmetals in group five of bismuth, Bi is bismuth, and N is nitrogen, P is phosphorus, AS is arsenic, and SB is antimony. So the metals in, or excuse me, the nonmetals in group 5A or 15, the nonmetals in group 5A or 15. So this is group 15. We have the nonmetals up top, nitrogen and phosphorus. Okay? Arsenic and antimony are the metalloids in this group, and bismuth is the metal in this group. Okay? These elements down here, you'll notice we kind of look over these sometimes. These are uh, pretty much artificial elements. They were probably fabricated in a lab somewhere, only lasted for a fraction of a second. So they're not something you really deal with outside of a theoretical physics lab. So the nonmetals in group five are nitrogen and phosphorus. And then last but not least, the metalloids in group 4A or 14, this is the same group we were looking at in question one, and we saw that carbon is a non-metal, tin and lead are metals, and so that leaves silicon and germanium as the metalloids in group 4A. Here we can see an important link between chemistry and our health. There are about 20 elements that are absolutely essential for our health and well-being. Of these 20, four of them make up about 96% of our body mass. And these include hydrogen over here, and oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon. We are considered carbon-based life forms. Of these four, the hydrogen and oxygen are present mostly in the water in our bodies, which by itself makes up about 55 to 60% of our body mass. And obviously water is essential for our survival. Then we also have the macro minerals, and these are highlighted in blue, okay, here. So we have sodium, magnesium, potassium, calcium, and then over here we also have some uh, chlorine, sulfur, phosphorus. And these are involved in the formation of bones and teeth, the regulation of cellular metabolism, and other processes like the maintenance of heart and blood vessels, muscle contractions, nerve impulses, and pH balance, which is important for our survival. And then the last type are these micro minerals, okay? And we can see these here highlighted in purple. These include vanadium, chromium, molybdenum, manganese, iron, cobalt, copper, zinc, and some others. And these are necessary in trace amounts for our various metabolic functions, right? So you probably know that you need a little bit of zinc in your diet. You might know that you need some iron in your diet, for instance, but you might not know that you need vanadium in your diet or chromium in your diet. Those are a little less commonly talked about. The other thing to keep in mind about these microminerals is that some of them can be deadly in higher doses. So you may need certain of these microminerals for your metabolic functions, but at higher doses, higher concentrations in your body, they can be deadly. So for instance, over here, we can see the chemical symbol AS, which stands for arsenic. If you've ever heard of arsenic, it was probably in the context of it being a deadly poison. Um, but arsenic is thought to play a role in human metabolism. It's not confirmed, but it is known to play a role in metabolism in rats and chickens and other animals. And so it is thought that it may also play a, a role in humans as well. But obviously in excess, arsenic is toxic. It's one of the most toxic compounds there is. So it's all about the size or the amount of the dosage that you get something to think about.